Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and you are at the intersection of sexuality and religion, where it meets at LDS Street and LGBTQ Avenue. Thank you for giving us an hour of your time to better understand the LGBTQ experience and to hear and listen to another story. We are grateful for those of you who are following along on the audio version of the podcast. If you are listening on one of your favorite audio podcast players like Stitcher, uh, iHeartMedia, Google, Apple, or one of the other podcast players, we invite you to subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And to help us build these bigger and stronger bridges between religion and sexuality, we invite you to leave a rating about this podcast as well. And it has to be a five-star rating. Those, those are the only ratings we're allowing you to give us. But if you do that, it does help us to uh, expand the reach of the Latter-Gay Stories podcast. So we appreciate that. And also, for those of you who are watching on a video version, there uh, is the comment section below. So you can follow along uh, with a real-time conversation with others who are, are watching this episode with you as well. If you have any questions, comments, um, or... Uh, some thoughts and feelings about this episode, feel free to share them in the comment section uh, wherever you're catching this, either on YouTube or on our Facebook channel. This episode and others are always available online at LatterGayStories.org, and you can also find every one of our podcast episodes in video form on our YouTube page, youtube.com backslash LatterGayStories. We are on all the social media platforms, so we invite you to subscribe to our channel and to follow along in all the fun. So thank you. Thank you for uh, sharing a little bit of your time with us and for uh, connecting with the Latter-Gay Stories guests. Speaking of guests, we've got another fantastic episode for you today. I always say that, um, but I also mean it because every episode, I think, just continues to build upon um, the general narrative that we're not alone, we're not broken, and that your best days are ahead. That there are people out here who love, support you, and are sharing your stories and helping um, young baby gays, young baby queers fall out of those closets in a healthy way and uh, helping each of us to stand up a little less broken um, or bruised when we fall out of those closets and run, um, run to safety and also run to happy and fulfilling lives. So today I want to welcome to the podcast Evan Smith, um, all the way from Massachusetts. Yep. So you're a, you're a little, you're a few miles away from the beehive. <laughs> I am. But welcome to the Latter Gay Stories podcast. I didn't really give you a great intro, but Evan is an attorney. Um, you are, uh, you've got plenty of awards and accolades in former Mormon callings. Yeah. Uh, you served in uh, stake presidency uh, multiple times. So the, we're really going to have a discussion about Mormonism and this topic of, of queerness and how um, your own personal navigation uh, through uh, understanding the queer experience um, from young eyes to the queer experience within Mormonism and then how it impacted your own family, I think is a, a key part of, of our discussion today. And then I also want to talk about a book you wrote. Um, it's called Gay Latter-day Saints, uh, Saints Crossroads. Uh, this is a free book that's available online in PDF form, or you can purchase it um, on Amazon, and and uh, you can get the paperback copy, which I uh, definitely and highly recommend. It is a it's a it's a story of their personal uh, Evan's personal experience um, navigating this topic, but it's also a story about his interactions within Mormonism. Uh, there are lessons of chronology there, um, showing kind of the historical nature of how um, Mormonism has handled this topic. It is also um, the, some personal experiences of your own son who come out yep. and, and how that, that whole coming out experience really changed your trajectory and how the Smith family moved forward. And through that, how you took the audience and the readers through that journey and brought them to a safer Zion. <laughs> I hope so. We can say that, right? Yeah, yeah. All right, so um, that's, a, that's a long overview of what this story is going to be about. I'm excited for it. I'm super excited to be able to have you in the studio. And, and just on a personal note, I want to thank you for being um, a supporter of the Latter-Gay Stories podcast um, in many ways. Thanks, Kyle. I, uh, love, I love what you do. I admire what you do. And uh, I'm happy to be here. Really happy to be here. So let's jump in. Um, tell the audience a little bit about a little bit more about who Evan Smith is. All right. So 46 years old, born and raised in Salt Lake City, um, Murray, Utah, specifically. Uh, moved to Massachusetts in 2003 after I graduated from law school. 
So I've lived there ever since, so almost 20 years now in, in Massachusetts. Uh, like you said, served in various state, various callings, uh, including um, as branch president, as a bishop, high counselor, and then in the state presidency as a counselor. Um, so I had a lot of opportunities to kind of see the church in action and to see how things work, why, how decisions are made. Um, and was married almost 25 years ago now. This is our 25th anniversary coming up in December for my wife, Cheryl, and me. Um, and our oldest son, Weston, is 23 years old. Um, and he came out to me, came out to us uh, when he was 16, and I was serving as bishop. I was three and a half years into my calling. It's usually a five-year calling. Um, and uh, it was... Uh, just an experience that completely um, changed the the way that I, it made it a lot more personal for me. I, um, two years prior to that, there was a young man in our uh, ward who came to me as bishop and, and didn't even really know how to express what he was feeling, but just said, described it to me in a way where I thought, I came away from that thinking, okay, I think he's gay. He didn't really know. He said, I, I, kind of when I see the images and I, I'm attracted to, I think, I, you know, men. And it was, there was a lot of shame there. And I looked at this kid and I thought, you know, he's the same age as my son. And I've known him almost his whole life. And I said, this is, I know he's an amazing young man. He's such a good kid. And that started me down a journey. It was 2013 when that, when that happened. And I just started researching a ton. I started really trying to, to understand gay sexual orientation, what the church taught about it. Um, and I was amazed at the prog the progression in, in, uh, Mormonism on this topic. I saw, uh, what Bill Bradford, a uh, BYU professor had, had taught about the, the science of, of sexual orientation, um, how it's, you know, an epigenetic thing and how it's, he said, it's, it's nature, not nurture. And so when I saw that, I was like, wow, okay, this is a former state president, mission president, BYU professor saying this. Um, I watched that YouTube video and I, I saw, you know, John DeLynn's video at the time uh, where you can be Mormon and be a, an ally. And so I was very fortunate to be able to, to counsel um, that young man in a way that I, 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 I hope it was helpful. I wish I would have done a little more with him where I would have said, Hey, you don't have to, you know, the, the decision that you're making here doesn't have to be one that keeps you in the church all the time. I was at that point still where I was trying to keep people in the church as a bishop. I was doing my job. I thought I needed to do that. Um, but I also wanted to be as affirming as my position would let me. Um, and I was fortunate to have those two years of that experience of becoming a little bit more of, a, of an ally, trying to become an ally um, before Wes came out to us. I think that helped me out a lot when he came out. How um, how was that message received by not only this gay young man that was in your ward, um, but other queer people or families of queer people that um, that you served with um, as a bishop? Did you see any positive impacts come from that more nuanced version of Mormonism? I did. Um, we saw it was it was it was interesting. I in twenty. 13, shortly after this young man uh, talked to me, um, the first presidency, I, I think it was because Utah had just legalized, there was a court ruling in Utah about gay marriage. So the first presidency sent out a message saying, we urge all local leaders to, to talk about this. Yeah, it was to, Herbert V. Kitchen, Derek Kitchen's case. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so when I when I saw that, I said, oh, they're urging us to. Okay, so I did a third hour, like a, a, at, during church, you know, you have the three hours, I did a combined men and women and youth discussion for an hour on that topic. Um, and my point in doing that mostly was to highlight the, the at the time, I think it was mormonsandgays.org um, website that the church had, because I knew there was information on that site that the members of our ward did not know about, um, including that the church now, whereas historically the church used to say gay sexual orientation itself, just having what they call same-sex attraction was a sin, now the church was saying it's not a, it's not a sin. It's not a choice. And that was on the website. Um, the sexual same sex attraction is not a choice. Acting on it is, is what they said. But, you know, just having those desires is not, I knew there was members of our ward that didn't 
weren't aware of that progression within the church teachings. And that website talked a lot about trying to love um, gay members of the church. And I also knew that that was probably something that several members had not been aware of. So we spent an hour talking about that. And my whole, my, my main point in doing that was to try to have that young man here without, you know, outing him or letting anyone know what was going on. I wanted, I wanted him to, to know that there were people in the ward that uh, he could feel safe with. Um, I wish I would have done a little better job in that meeting than I did. Again, I was in the Bishop mindset and trying to uphold the doctrine in a, in a way that, um, you know, was, was, I, I was trying to be a good bishop to the church rather than a good kind of minister necessarily to, to the needs of, of that young man and other, other queer members of the congregation that might be listening. Um, but because of the focus that uh, we spent on love and on those new teachings and, and things, I think it, uh, well, I know it had the result of several other members of our ward coming out to me over the course of the next six months, um, and telling me their experiences. So I think just being able to have that conversation and talk about it openly in a public way and being willing to try to say, hey, we need to show more love, uh, it made a lot of difference in, in our ward. It's interesting uh, just to bring Mormonism and use Mormonism against Mormonism here. Um, but it's often said that there's opposition in all things. So if you are now supporting and um, suckering in a very Mormon term, um, running to the LGBTQ community. Did you notice in your ward um, people who are now running away from you because of your affirming um, nature and your your willingness to reach out to this marginalized community? Did that happen? That's a great question. Um, yes and no. Uh, and I say that because um, I had some members approach me and say, are you sure about what you're teaching? And I was walking that fine line of not teaching anything that the church wasn't currently teaching, right? But I was also emphasizing love, that we need to be more loving, that I was telling the youth, you need to stop saying, oh, that's so gay. Like in a negative way, I was trying to like, we need to change the way we're approaching this topic. And so I had some members who felt uncomfortable and they did approach me about it. And I felt like they were kind of pushing back, but I was able to say, look, I, I'm, it's right here on the church's website. I'm not doing anything. So I, they could only run away so far because if they wanted to stay consistent with supporting, you know, the brethren and supporting the church's positions, they, they were out of line with the church if they ran away really far, if that makes sense. Like now the church has progressed to the point where if you're really homophobic, like if you're blatantly out there and, and trying to cause harm and, and just feeling that uh, strong homophobia, it, you can find a lot of church resources that say that's not good either. This, yeah, and this whole time as you're navigating this world, um, helping the queer people uh, within your congregation, did you have any inclinations that your own son was impacted by this topic, or was was there was there anything in your world that that led you to believe I'm not being prepared to save the ward, I'm being prepared to save my own son? Uh, I think subconsciously. Yes. Um, it's interesting because when Wes came out to us, uh, Cheryl reminded me, she said, do you remember those few times over the, his growing up years when he was like, you know, toddler and then, you know, a young kid or where you would ask me if Wes was gay. Um, I would see kind of a mannerism or something. And I thought, I wonder if Wes is gay. And so I would ask Cheryl and she knew at that point, um, and sadly, uh, that I was, I had pretty homophobic views. Uh, before 2013, I, I, I was, and I, I, I try to give myself, not be too hard on myself and say it was because of the way I was raised and the, not, not that my parents were bad in any way, but I was raised in a, in a very conservative, um, dogmatic area. And I just believed the church doctrine at the time. I felt very, she, she answered me when I asked her that question about Wes, she would say, no, don't worry about it. He's not. But in her mind, she was thinking he might be. And she was fine with that because she, you know, grew up in an area completely differently and with a different mindset. And I'm, I'm so incredibly grateful for that and for the influence she had on, on, on me. But, um, yeah, I think subconsciously, maybe I thought it could be, but I didn't in my conscious thought, I, I didn't have any idea that Wes was gay. 
So what year did Wes come out to you? 2015. So two, yeah, two years. Uh, and, and during those two years, I had done all that research and I, I was so grateful that I was able, when he came out as gay, I did, I, I did, we were in the car and he, uh, he told me, and my first thought, my first statement back to him, I regret this at the time. I said, are you sure? Um, and, and cause I, I, I didn't know if he was bisexual or what he was. And so I regret that I said it like that. Um, and he says, yeah, dad. I, and I, I'm like, so no reaction at all. Cause he had, he had had a girlfriend and I said, so kiss. And like, there's like, you you don't feel anything. And he's like, no, <laughs> and I said, okay, all right, well, I love you and I will support you. And I, you know, this doesn't change anything. So that was part of the conversation, but it wasn't my first thing. And if I were to give any advice to parents, it would be to the first thing you need to say when your child comes out to you as gay is I love you. This doesn't change anything. And I love you. So that, that I wish I would have done that. But, um, I think those, I'm grateful that I was able to say it in the same conversation because of those prior years of research and experience and, and also just loving, loving queer members of our ward that, um, I, I didn't know were there before I got kind of into that space and started talking about it. I want to reset this scene for a second because here you are as a bishop serving in a ward where you are serving and ministering to this queer community. You are seeing them. You're allowing them to be heard. You're letting them know that they're not alone and they have an advocate in you. You've also seen some personal changes within your life. Um, your wife has recognized that as well as you've uh, made this journey through um, navigating Mormonism and um, marginalization, and, yeah. and especially within this topic. Your own son comes out, which probably, in, in, for all those who are parents of, of queer kids, you know this seal of living reality that um, too often we're met at the kitchen table with this dichotomy. Um, it's the policy versus the person. Yeah. Um, when you see the real world view um, through the lens of someone that you created, your own son or daughter who's experiencing this, um, our, our minds shift completely. And it usually errs on the side of love and compassion as opposed to policy and pulpit. But I was doing the math um, when you said uh, 2015. And in my mind, I said, this is the most monumental, in my opinion, uh, one of the largest shifts in the game yeah. for Mormonism and the LGBTQ topic. And that was because of November 5th, 2015, when the church deemed um, queer people apostates, right. um, prevented children from being baptized into the church if they come from a family of, of, of gay parents. Right. So all of this was happening at the same time. Here was the church you love and support, and we're trying to create some nuanced space in. Right. And all of a sudden, there's this new policy. Walk us through that. What what changed in your dynamic, and how has your family experience oh. altered? Oh, man. Um, so June 2015 was the Supreme Court ruling uh, for marriage equality that made you know same-sex marriage legal throughout the country. And the church's response to that was in November. 2015. In between that time, it was about September 2015 when Wes came out to us. Um, and so I, it was, it was a couple months of knowing I had a gay son when the November policy happened. And I was actually, we were, Cheryl and I were on a, a romantic getaway in Puerto Rico. And I remember where I was standing in the hotel room when I saw on my phone, the leaked news that the church had adopted that policy. And I felt like a truck hit me. I just felt like, how, how can this church that I've loved and that I've devoted my life to um, in you know, so many hours and, and so much time and money, and not, not, not only just that, my heart, I loved it. I was a believer all in. How can that and all those good feelings I felt from the church now have this policy that calls my son, if he were to find the lo love in his life, if, if he finds love in his life, he's an apostate because he wants to have someone because he wants to have a family that, that he knows is less likely to, to end in, in, in hardship. I mean, the, 
part of my research was seeing the statistics for mixed orientation marriages, how, how often they fail, um, and how the, the psychological well-being of members of the church who choose to stay celibate their entire life is so poor. And as a father, you, I, I can't want that for my son, no matter what the church is teaching me. So I saw that policy and I, I couldn't reconcile it. Um, I, th- I thought it has to be wrong. There's this, this, I was at that point now in, in my experience in the church where I saw that there was imperfection in the teachings in a lot of, and, and, I, and I saw that there were doctrines that had changed, uh, many doctrines that had changed over time. And so I, I kind of took a step back and said, okay, this is where they're at now, but it's, this is going to be one of those things that's going to change over time. And so I said, I'm going to continue in my calling and in my church service with the focus on love. Um, I, I had about a year into being Bishop. Um, I started to feel more of a desire to focus on love in my calling. And so I decided there was not going to be a topic that I taught in the ward that didn't talk about charity you know, charity is the pure love of Christ. And so every single topic I taught, whether it was tithing, whether it was whatever, if, you know, we were we were talking about it was always focused on on love and the, the youth in the ward started calling me bishop charity because i always talked about charity i wouldn't ever stop not talk about it and so i just decided when the policy came out that okay we're gonna just emphasize love again and i'm gonna i'm gonna kind of almost ignore that and just say love's what matters and and but we did have because of the policy when they did that the, the church actually also um had another they this time it wasn't just an urging, it was a requirement that you do, uh, you, you talk about how the Supreme Court ruling did not change um, the church's position on gay marriage. So I had another third hour combined lesson um, where we, we talked, this is you know, a couple years after the first one, where uh, we talked about it some more. And this was more of, an, of, a, of a conversation. The first one I did in 2013 was more of just a, me kind of reading and, 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 and talking about an issue because um, I didn't know where the war really stood. And I didn't want to have kind of off like some comments that went in the wrong direction. But this time I felt like it was a little bit more safe to have open it up to conversation. And we had an amazing, amazing conversation. Several members of the ward were like, I don't know why gay marriage is a problem. You know, we, it's, it's fine. They, they were very careful in how they said it. And we all, it, it's too bad that we all have to be so careful in the church in, in how we talk about those things. Do you think that was a Mormonism thing? Or did that have some, um, th- that shift in belief? Was there some shift there because of your proximity to events, historical events, boots on the ground in terms of same-sex marriage? Massachusetts was one of the first states yeah. in the union um, it was the first to, yeah. uh, to allow um, gay marriage. So do you think the, the people in Massachusetts were just primed to believe this because that was something that was happening in real time? Or was there a genuine desire on behalf of Mormons, this within Mormonism, to see um, better inclusion and love? Both. I think both. I think the fact that gay marriage had already been legal in Massachusetts for, I think, a couple of years at least by that point, um, there was a lot of members of the ward were like, "It's it's legal here and hasn't changed anything. Like it doesn't affect my straight marriage. It doesn't, you know." doesn't change, uh, it doesn't change the church's approach. To, like it, it, let's just accept this and be okay with it. There was actually a lot of discussion in that second meeting about how you can support something politically and you can support it in, in like prohibition, for example, right? You can be against, you can say that drinking alcohol is a sin. That's what, that's what Mormonism believes, teaches, but you can think it's really bad policy to have the government say prohibition. So we talked a lot about how you can have those two, you can hold those two thoughts where you can say gay marriage is good for society and I support it. And I love my, my gay neighbors who are married while at the same time, if you want, if you have a religious belief that it's a sin, you can, you can maintain that. So we talked about that. I I wish again, I have regrets and I wish at the time I would have taught yeah, but if you are out there saying that it's a sin, you're causing harm to those gay neighbors. And like, you, in my opinion now, you can't say that something is a, a sin uh, when it is related to just who someone is because that just causes that person to feel 
like who they are is antithetical to God. And that causes trauma that I, I wish I had never been a part of causing. And that was partly what prompted me to get into this space was the regret I had about some of the complicity I had in, in causing those thoughts. I think people. that's, that's a really great channel uh, that we should f just row down for a minute. This idea of regret, um, because I think there's going to be regret on um, all sides. I mean, regret is a multifaceted diamond yeah. um, where yeah. we look at it and we can just see something sparkle in a different way. And and maybe the first uh, part of this regret that I, that I thought of just listening to you talk was um, this very real experience of the people in Massachusetts who, as you said, um, had seen gay marriage happen for years in their state at this point and realized that there was no... Uh, illicit harm that yeah. was done to their lives. They, they woke up in the morning, they put their pants on the same way, they went to work or school the same way, right. and life just moved forward. The problem with that, especially when you look at it through the lens of Mormonism, is that for the previous five, six, seven decades, the church has taught a narrative contrary to the, the experience that was happening in Massachusetts. Yep. Um, the 1984 memorandum that Oaks put out um, yep. said that if we just allow just allow same-sex marriages, that is akin to national suicide. Yeah. Um, he said a single generation would essentially equate to global suicide, where we will depopulate the whole world. Yeah, which doesn't make any sense because then everybody has to choose a gay relationship rather than a heterosexual relationship. Like, that, that whole idea doesn't make, it's so, it's fear-based. It's just fear of something that's different and it doesn't have any sense, any logical, rational sense to it at all. Well, and I think that's where regret just kind of creeps into here because yeah. now you see um, the first generation of gay marriages happening and none of those things that Mormonism promised would happen are happening. And so sometimes the stalwart Mormon will say, well, we have to wait this out. We've got to wait for the second generation to happen. And now yeah. we're seeing the second generation. The regret comes in, in this idea that I believed some yeah. of these policies. I believed what the church was, was telling me about same-sex marriages, uh, gender identities, and the real lived experiences, the visible parts of these stories, the fact that people like you come on podcasts like this and share your stories that aren't necessarily standing up saying, see, Mormonism, you were wrong. It was, see, I've always been able to live to the fullest measure of my creation. And yeah. once, I, once I did that, then I was still able to thrive and I still am happy and I still find spiritual experiences and I still find joy in this journey. Those are all things that were contrary to the message. So maybe the regret here in this conversation is regret on, on the part of theology, yes. um, not only within Mormonism, but this is a systemic issue within Christianity and, and other faith other, traditions. Other, yeah. that, even non-faith traditions. There, there are a lot of secular... You know, Wes, Wes is in Toronto now and has a lot of LGBTQ friends up there who come from families who are not religious. And some of those kids are still in the closet because they're worried. And I don't know why it's such a problem, but it's a big one. So fortunately for you, you made those shifts. And, yeah. and unfortunately for you, it sh you shifted harder because someone close to you was impacted by this topic. And I, and I see this, that story after story after story, yes, it's one thing to make some minor shifts in thinking and believing and better understanding this space. But in a very real sense, when someone close to you comes out, your whole world changes. It does. It completely changes. And the regret that I, most of the regret that I felt, I think stemmed from the fact that I was a part of upholding the theology that caused people like my son harm. And I don't think you really understand it until you have someone close to you that you know and love, who you know as a person, and, and they're just good to the core. And you realize, wow, I was helping prop up doctrine that, you know, at the time, even, even with that, that young man who came to me initially, right, I was as loving as I felt I could be as a bishop. Um, but even with him, he, he wasn't my son. And so it was, well, there was a bit of separation there. It was, this is the way the church is approaching it for, for gay members. 
and this is, you know, things you can do and decisions you can make, and I will love you no matter what you do, blah, blah, blah. But there, it wasn't as real and it wasn't as powerful of, holy cow, this is harmful. Like it was, I'm sorry for the conundrum that you're in and it, and it sucks and I will love you no matter what you do. But there wasn't as much of a feeling of, wow, I am, if, if I don't counteract this doctrine, if I don't actively try to, to, and vocally publicly tell people that the doctrine is wrong, then I'm a part of the problem. And that didn't really sink in until Wes came out. There's a lot of your story um, from this point forward that uh, we don't have time to cover in a yeah. one hour episode. But kind of following this vein, I want to talk about the things that you have done to start changing that, to start impacting policy, to start questioning doctrine. Um, and you wrote about this in your book, but I also wanted to have you just speak to it personally about the, um, you eventually are released as a bishop, mm -hmm. then you're called as a stake, uh, called into the stake presidency. Yeah, first counselor in the stake presidency. And, and from these experiences within the stake presidency, you're able to have um, a lot of interaction with general authorities. Yeah. Um, and even further than that, your family, your last name is Smith. You are a multi-generational Mormon. Yep. Um, the roots run very, very deep. Um, your family has, your own father um, has connections to President Nelson. So yep. there, are, um, there are super deep Mormon roots to this story. You, unlike many other people, have, a, have an opportunity and a position to speak truth to power, um, to the hierarchy within the church. So bypassing a lot of the stuff that I'll frankly say, you can go grab the book and start reading um, <laughs> a, a lot of this journey um, that happened between Wes is coming out and the stories that I want to now kind of focus on. And that is um, your discussions with stake president or with the general authorities okay. um, and how you start priming the pump um, to try to help the church start seeing areas where the church didn't have to make radical changes. The church really was in a position to be able to accept and understand this topic in a healthy way by using their own doctrine yeah. and by recognizing the innate worth and value of its queer Latter-day Saint members. Yeah. Um, which, which of those stories did you think were monumental in terms of your own personal progress, but also what were some of the things that you had uh, in terms of, of real honest discussions with general authorities? So, um, I think, you know, when I was released as Bishop, uh, it was a little over a year after Wes had come out to us. Um, so I was in a very progressive nuanced space, uh, in my belief. Um, and then a year later got called into the stake presidency. And when that happened, um, you know, I got the phone call, the way it works when you get called into stake presidency, you, you interview in the morning with the general authority and their companion who's usually an area authority. Um, you have a really quick interview in the morning. And then if you get called back to the, to the chapel in the afternoon, then you know that you're either getting called a stake president or as a counselor. Um, and when we got the call to come back, Cheryl looked at me and she's like, I don't know if this is good. Like we just went through, basically went through hell as, as Bishop and trying to have this cognitive dissonance and work it all out in our heads. And we had got to a place where we were like, if we emphasize love and that's what we really focus our church membership and belief on, then we can do it. She says, I don't know if I can do this at the stake level. Like that's, this is a step up. And I said, this is an opportunity to, to make the, the message of love even stronger and here and, and reach more people. And so that's how I went into the serving the stake presidency. And we had an interview with the general authority when he called us. And I think he knew that Wes was gay because Wes had barely left on a mission a month before that. Um, even though his mom, even though Cheryl had kind of told Wes, don't, you don't need to, she actually begged him not to serve a mission because she knew that it would be hard psychologically for him. Um, Wes wanted to go for various reasons that, you know, he can speak to, but um, that general authority, I, I, I don't know, but I suspect that the stake president uh, at the time had, had kind of told him that, because Wes had come out to that stake president before he went on his mission. So I suspect that that general authority knew when he was calling us uh, to be in the stake presidency that Wes was gay. And Cheryl expressed reservation in that interview. 
she's told the general authority, she says, I don't want to serve. I don't, we don't want to be on a pedestal. We don't want people looking at our family. We don't want people judging our family. She didn't come out and say, like, we didn't bring up the fact that Wes was gay in the interview because it doesn't have anything to do with my service in the church. Shouldn't anyway. And uh, that general authority said to us, you're being called because of your family, because of your kids. And that was interesting. Interesting to hear him say that. And, and he talked a lot in that interview about change in the church and about how change is talked about and debated in the church hierarchy in, in, a, in you know amongst, amongst the brethren and all the general authorities sometimes for decades. And then the prophet is the one who decides when to essentially pull the trigger on change and make it happen. And so he said, there's, there's a lot of stuff that goes into these decisions and things. And, you know, at the time, I don't know if he was talking about, you know, the change to home teaching, changing to ministering or whatever, but, but I think very strong, I feel very strongly that he was hinting to us, like hang in there, you know, the church's position on, on gay marriage or on, on LGBTQ issues is not going to be forever how it, how it is. Now, I, I can't say for sure if that's what he had in mind, but there's a lot of feeling of that. So that was when I got called in the stake presidency. And then we served in, the, I served in the stake presidency for two years before uh, the stake president I was serving with moved. And when he moved, the stake presidency gets reorganized. Um, and so I mean, there's a whole process again, because you're released as a counselor when the president is released, right? So I got released and then went through that whole interview in the morning and then got called back in the afternoon. Um, I, I had a, an assumption that I would be I would stay in the state presidency, at least as a counselor, because uh, it's usually a nine-year calling, and I'd only served for two years. So I come into the afternoon callback interview knowing that I'm at least going to serve as a counselor, again, continue serving. And um, what was supposed to be a 10-minute interview with this particular general authority that I, I write about this experience in Chapter 9 of my book uh, turned into about a 70-minute uh, interview uh, while we were... The both of us, he and I, were missing a leadership training meeting of a hundred or so people in in the chapel. Uh, we were in a room off to the side having this this discussion. So it was obvious that something was going on. And Cheryl's out in the hall waiting for to come in because typically what happens is you, you you meet for five or ten minutes and they just say, "Are you worthy to serve?" Yes, and then they call in your wife to have her be there when they extend the calling to you, so that you know she can accept and support you and your calling. That's what happened before two years prior. Uh, this time around, um, it started off with the general authority saying, I understand that you've had some hard times. Your son came home from a mission early. And I said, yeah. So Wes had barely come home uh, from his mission uh, in May. And this was in September of uh, 2019. And I, I said, yeah. And I did. I was kind of thinking, why is he bringing this up? Why, why does this have anything? And I said, yeah, yeah, he did. Um, and he said, how do you, how do you feel about that? And that just started the discussion. And I said, I was, I was honest with him. I said, I, I'm happy that Wes has decided to, I'm happy he came home from his mission uh, because it was either he stay on his mission and continue to have suicidal thoughts um, and maybe something worse would happen or he come home and live and be happy and and he's he's leaving the church and he asked me how do you feel about your son leaving the church i said i i'm, I'm glad because he's in a good place now he's happier he's he's healthy like he can get there right he has a lot of a lot of work left to do to get there but he's he's on a good path now and he said i do you express those thoughts publicly and i i said well no in my calling i don't ever you know I don't talk about that. I had given a couple talks actually in our state conference about a week after Wes came over his mission. Actually, I gave a talk on LGBTQ acceptance and on how people, why people are sometimes leaving the church and how we need to love everyone who's having doubts or questions and how we also need to show more love to our LGBTQ people. I did that in the general session of state conference. I didn't cross any lines. I was very careful always in my callings, not to ever, you know, teach something that the church wasn't I mean, teaching. You're an attorney. Yeah. I'm an, yeah. I'm an attorney. So I know how to, I, I think anyway, I try to know how to, you know, go up to that point and, and not violate, uh, the, the, the cross the line that the church doesn't want you to cross. Um, and I had, he, so I think the general authority kind of heard what I was saying and said, okay, but you can't, 
I don't know if you can serve in the church in this calling if you're happy that one of your children is not in the church. And he he talked about knowing. He talked he talked about a lot of things. It was a hard conversation, really hard conversation. That he compared. Uh, he said, I, "Maybe I can understand how you're feeling because if you if if there are children who decide to you know do uh, leave the church or or if there's someone who's uh, like I can only imagine. Let's say someone's child uh, decided to you know commit a crime and and leave the church." Um, you know, I can, I, I can imagine how you might relate to them. And I said, well, there's a being gay is not, you're not causing harm to anyone if you're doing that. And he said, well, if they raise children, then they would be causing harm to those children. And I said, oh, I've, I've read tons of studies that show that gay parents are actually statistically, maybe even better for, for some children, raising children in their home because they have worked so hard to get them into their home. There's so much more that's involved in, in getting a child if you're a gay couple. And I said, I don't, I don't think there's any harm there. And he said, oh, we'll just have to agree to disagree. He talked about um, how my tithing money would go to help the church pay to make sure that gay couples could not show affection on church properties. And I'm thinking, why, why are you bringing this up? Like, he seemed very much almost like he was stuck, right? Because I think there were a lot of men that he interviewed. As part of the process of getting called in the stake presidency, you're supposed to tell them three names of other men in the stake who you think would be good as stake president. And I, I've heard afterwards that a lot of, a lot of men wrote my name. They, they told him my name. And so I think he felt, and, and this other man who had been called a stake president had specifically asked for me to continue serving as a counselor. So I, th I suspect the general authority felt a little stuck where he was like, okay, the stake wants Evan. The people here love Evan and they want him to serve. But I, I, can I, can I try to get, I don't know if this was in his mind, but felt like it. Can I convince Evan to not serve? Can I convince him that this is not a good thing? And, um, we went back and forth for, for a long time. And he got to the point finally where he said, okay, I will let you continue to serve because you've convinced me that you won't cross that line publicly. But I do think that you, it would be better if you were to be publicly sad about your son not being in the church. And I said, I can't do that. Yeah, but I, I will not publicly teach things that the church doesn't accept. I told him, I said, I, I think the church will change on gay marriage. It'll get there. He said, no, the law of chastity will never change. And I said, well, what about polygamy? He said, oh, I, people use that excuse, but it's not the same. And I said, well, actually, it's quite a, I mean, there was scripture that talked about, there was actually canonized scripture that said monogamy is DNC 101. The old DNC 101 said monogamy is the, what the church does. That's that the, we don't do polygamy. And they had to take that canon out to, to allow for polygamy. So you actually had a change in scripture. I said, you could have a change in, and you, could, you could allow gay marriage without changing any scripture at all. I said, it's, it's going to be in some ways a lot easier to allow for gay marriage than it was to allow for polygamy and then to change it, change it back to non polyg you know, to non polygamy. Now we're back at monogamy and he, he didn't, didn't accept that. Um, the most hurtful things I think he said in the interview. In fact, I know the most hurtful thing was he, he looked at me and he said, um, you, if you ever leave the church, if you ever stop believing because of this issue or any other issue, I I'm telling you as a special witness of Christ that your family will fall apart. Your wife will leave you. Um, and you will, you will regret leaving the church. And I, I said, I don't believe that. I actually told him, he, he said that to me three or four times during the course of the interview. And I said, I don't, I don't believe that. He said, I know my wife loves me regardless of my belief in the church. We have a great relationship. We are, you know, really close and, and just we are committed to our family and our kids. He said, no, I, I, as a special witness in Christ, at, we ended the interview, he shook my hand. He said, remember, I'm telling you as a special witness of Christ, this, these things will happen. And I was, I, I was very floored. So I, Cheryl comes into the room and sees me sees my facial expression, even though I had got to that point with the general authority where I was still going to serve because I wasn't crossing a line. She just saw in my, in my eyes that something had happened and she was out there wondering for 70 minutes, what was going on. And, um, he told her we had a good discussion and she goes, what was it about? Was it about, she, she kind of, she could guess. She said, was it about Wes? And he said, well, yeah, yeah, but I need to get into this other meeting, you know, president Smith, why don't you calm your wife down? I'll come back after the med, after this training meeting that was, we'd been missing. 
is over and we'll, we'll, we'll continue to talk and I'll extend the calling to you. He had told me that I was going to, you know, I was going to be called as a counselor at that point. Um, and Cheryl just, it was too hard. We looked at each other and she said, I, I can't do this anymore. I can't, I can't continue to try to, f I can't feel that pressure that I can't love my child the way that I know that he needs to be loved. And that I, I feel shame for loving him the way that's best for him, the way that I know as a mom, he should be loved. So we walked out of the building and went home. It was a 30 minute drive for us to get home. That's how it is in Massachusetts. You don't live next to the church. You don't like walk home. Um, we got to the parking lot and I had to, I had to like catch her. She almost fell. Uh, she was so overcome with just, she said, I'm, am I destroying our, 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 our salvation and our eternity? Like, am I, what's going on? And I said to her, I said, no, I am a hundred percent confident that we're just ahead of our time. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Like we're, I don't want to be prideful and say like, we know more than other people, but at the same time, I just feel like our family was in a situation where we were ready for something that the church isn't quite ready for yet. And, but I do feel very strongly the church will get there because I think the members want it. Um, and I think the leaders of the church just need to understand that what the members want, um, will not destroy the church. I think there's a lot of fear right now from the members that, or from the leaders, that if they allow for this thing, that so many other members will leave because a lot of homophobic members will leave the church and things like that. And maybe there will be some, I'm sure in 1978, when the church changed its position on allowing black members to have the priesthood, I, I, I know there were some people that left, but it was a, it was a small minority. I, I have to imagine if the church were to spend a few years softening some of its tone on LGBTQ issues, talking about it a little differently, nuancing some things, preparing the membership that they wouldn't be as it wouldn't be a, such a catastrophe that I do think some of the leaders think it might be. I think uh, fortunately for you, you w you were able to hear from a special witness of Christ that night, and she went home with you. I oh, I love thank you, Kyle. I love that's true, that's very true. She um, she's the most kind when it comes to just her in like the instinctive kind loving um direction she's got that uh and and she she was always way ahead of me in that way and i think yeah i think you alluded to this we've brought we've discussed this one of the greatest fears within mormonism um they fear the visibility the stories the lived experiences of the lgbtq community because it just hasn't matched the rhetoric that we've heard coming from uh, 50 North Temple from pulpits across Zion for many, many, many decades. Yeah. And that is the great fear. The fear is, and you, you brought it up, we'll lose membership. Um, you were already hemorrhaging members over right. this topic. The November 2015 policy was a, a grand example of that where so many people packed their bags and left the church. Yeah. The, the loudest sounds you heard in Mormonism in 2015 and 2016 were the sounds of feet walking out of yep. those chapel doors and then closing the, the doors behind them never to return again. Right. So the church is already seeing a hemorrhaging in, in its membership over this topic, but is it hemorrhaging for the right reasons? Are, it's okay, in my opinion, I, I suppose it would be okay to get rid of those ultra homophobic, um, bigoted, mean spirited people um, right. who, who would just, think it would be okay to, to have them exit exit but, first. Yeah. And th right. that would be the calling that you want. You right. want to see th that type of non-saint Mormon um, right. fall out of uh, out of the church, but to see really good families um, impacted by this topic in a negative way at the hands of the church is what's so difficult yeah. uh, for me to wrap my head around, and it's what drives nearly every single latter gay story episode. Yeah. It is the story of people who couldn't survive in in the nuance any longer that the religion, that the faith, that the God that they love so much was so contrary to the to what they saw at their own kitchen table. Yes. And that is that is what propels us to do something different. Um, that is what propels us to move into a direction of love and kindness, even if it's in our own, I, I don't want to say our, our own isolation, but even if it's in our own bubble, where our own periphery, the, just those closest to us, we hunker and we love and support our 
the basic family unit and, and support and lift that. And then as energy allows, then, then we can start spreading that, um, outside of that kitchen table experience. So, uh, and maybe we, maybe we shift into that direction. You did start, um, spending a lot of time trying to hit that periphery, trying to hit those Latter-day Saint families who are impacted by this topic or start priming the well, um, to those families who did not yet need your message. Yeah. They didn't know why, um, this message might impact them down the road or they didn't, they weren't aware that this message might impact them down the road, but when it did, and when they turned to their church, when their son or daughter come out, um, and they turned to their church and found that the church had no resources available for them. Um, you created some resources. So let's talk a little bit about your book okay. because I, I think, um, in terms of, of chronology, that's about the point where, I mean, you've, you've went through multiple versions of stake presidency, uh, yeah. callings now, um, your situation with your own son, um, his life has gotten infinitely better, yeah. um, on the other side of the aisle. The members in, of your stake, have, uh, they've recognized that. Um, you, as husband and wife, have seen a dynamic shift within your family. And you've also realized that um, by living more honest and authentic, life still turned out to be pretty fair. Yeah, really good, actually. And yeah. it wasn't all those things that general authority promised. Right. Which, again, is causing all these dichotomies and all these nuances. So right. um, in, comes, um, in comes your book. And, uh, it's gay Latter-day Saint, um, crossroads. By the way, I love what you say at the beginning of your episodes where do, do, you're do. like the intersection of LGBTQ and church and religion. Cause that's crossroads, right? That's yeah, that's exactly it. it she's not focusing really well, but, um, th so this is your book. This is the hard copy of the book. Yep. Um, you also have a free digital version, so yes. it, it isn't something that people are required to purchase no. um, in order to get a hold of it. But let's let's talk about the genesis. Um, why the book? Um, what is the message of the book, and how does that impact Mormonism? Right. So, I think the book started actually again. You know, Cheryl was kind of the driving force for my idea to do it. Uh, she did a Facebook post um, right after that meeting with, that we had with the General Authority. And just explained what what happened um, and talked about how she was taking a break from church and I said I, I decided I wanted to do I wanted to do something like that her post kind of went viral like got a lot of attention a lot a lot of people uh, responded in, in a very positive way um, so I decided I was going to do a post so I started writing and then the lawyer I, I said not a good thing. I think it's a bad thing sometimes, but I can't, I can't only talk about some stuff. I want to, I want to be very comprehensive. And so I decided, uh, I just would turn something into an essay and then it became a, a thesis or a manifesto or something. I, I didn't know what to exactly call it, but I, I just kept typing for months and months. And it was interesting the, the week after I had that uh, meeting with the general authority, uh, president Oaks gave a talk in general conference called the two great commandments where that was like the nail in the coffin for me. I came out of the meeting with the general authority feeling like, okay, now I can continue to just like focus on love. And I was okay staying in the church. Cheryl was taking a break, but I was like, I'm going to go to church and continue to try to affect change from within. And, um, when he gave that talk, I said, okay, it can't just be me doing it locally. I need to do something bigger because in that talk, he was, he said, you can, <laughs> you can love if you're condoning, uh, you know, LGBTQ members in, in decisions that are contrary to the church's standards, then you're, you can love them too much, right? You're, you're the, the law to love God and to keep his commandments comes ahead of the law to love the commandment to love others. Um, and that just, that for me just was too much. So I decided to do something, a post, and it turned into a very long thing, um, that at one point, uh, a friend of mine, um, Derek Knox, who's uh, in Massachusetts as well, he's one of the co-hosts of the Beyond the Block podcast. Um, we had had uh, started becoming friends because you know he's local, and I reached out to him, and I love his podcast because he uses scriptures to show that the church can't. If the church just embraced its own scriptures and embraced its own you know teachings, you can one hundred percent affirm and and accept gay marriage and gender identity and everything that the church is fighting against now, actually, if they believe their own stuff, you could get there. Um, 
but I, uh, reached out, um, to him. He knew I was doing something. I was writing, writing this thing. And he said, I have a friend, uh, who is a writer and she's a member of the church, uh, Marcy McPhee in Texas. Um, maybe she can help you. Cause I, I sent the thing to him and he was like, I was kind of, I, I, he didn't say this, but he was like, I, I think he was like, this thing is kind of a beast. It's long and it's unwieldy. So Marcy, I, I, I hired Marcy as an editor and she took the, the manuscript and, um, I told her, I said, don't change any of my arguments. Um, I want to keep everything there. Um, but let's, you know, work on, on some other aspects of it. And she, uh, helped soften the tone. Actually, I should say in between, in between these things, um, I had sent the, the draft of the manuscript, um, when I was calling it an extended essay at the time, uh, to the brethren, I got some of their email addresses and I emailed them a copy. Um, president Iring was in town for a funeral of Clayton Christensen, who was a general authority in the Massachusetts area. So I emailed the Q15 and I, I said, Hey, you know, president Iring, while you're in town, I'd love to meet with you. Um, in that, in that email, I mentioned, as you, as you said, that my, President Nelson came to my dad's funeral because uh, I grew up in a ward where there were three of President Nelson's daughters in my ward. So we, I, I met President Nelson several times growing up. He would come to church and support his grandkids and things. And so just because it's not like my dad had a real close relationship with him, but he, he knew him well enough. He came to the funeral. Um, I mentioned that in my email and I said, Hey, you know, I, I, I not, I, I talked about the bad experience I had with the general authority. And I said, I've written this thing that I'm going to, post on social media or something I meet mean, with someone. I, it's a working title right now, but I'm thinking section 139 of the Doctrine and Covenants would be a great title for yeah. this. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Um, and when I when I sent that email, I didn't get a response. I wasn't really even respect, expecting a response necessarily uh, immediately. But a few days later, I did get a call from another general authority um, who was serving in the North America Northeast Area Presidency. Um, and he said, uh, I'd like to meet with you and Cheryl and your stake president about what you wrote about your document. I said, okay, great. Uh, we're going to be in Utah for my mom's 70th birthday, uh, you know, next week. He said, great, come meet with me in church headquarters. I said, okay. Um, and they flew our stake president out, uh, with us, uh, to, to meet together. And I had over a three hour meeting with this general authority and, uh, this other general authority. And, um, is it a he who not who shall not be named or no? I could actually I I, I haven't named uh, so the the general authority we met with in Massachusetts I haven't given his name um, prior to this time but I, I'm actually comfortable now talking about him because I feel like transparency is really important in my book I say I don't want anything any negative messages sent to him or any and I I still don't want that but I've seen so many lives um, I I've become more aware of the harm that's caused by not having the openness and the transparency and having uh, kind of the accountability that church leaders should be held to. So uh, the, that general authority that we met with in September for the stake presidency organization, his name's John A. McCune. And he was uh, just recently called as a general authority, uh, I think six months prior. So I wouldn't doubt if our stake presidency reorganization was the first one he had done. Um, the second general authority that actually we went with in Salt Lake about my document was Alan Haney, um, who's a really kind, affable, personable guy. Um, and who had actually, uh, been at my law firm as a partner for over 25 years. Um, so they, they got the right guy to meet with me. Um, and he told us at the beginning of our meeting with him that he had actually been on a plane flying from Boston to Salt Lake city and was sitting, ended up sitting next to elder McCune right after our experience had happened. And elder McCune, he said, elder McCune was distraught about what happened. And I, I should give some credit to elder McCune that he apologized to Cheryl and me. We, we came back and talked with him. I came back, uh, later that night after I went home with Cheryl from the stake, from, you know, the, the, she, after she, crying and stuff. We went home and I decided to come back and talk to him again. I spent another two hours talking with him. And then the next day, Cheryl decided to come back, um, after our general session of state conference where I was released as a counselor and, and bore a very quick testimony. 
she uh, talked to him, to the, him for over 40 minutes with our stake president and the area authority that was there with him. Um, and uh, it was amazing. And at the end of that, he, he did apologize to us for what he had, he had said and said that he was too harsh in how he treated us. So I, I give him a lot of credit for that. Um, so it was interesting that he had felt so bad about it that he talked to Elder Haney for most of that plane ride home about whether he had done the right thing and how he had approached it. And Elder Haney was telling us about that. Um, then the interview, we're in the meeting with, with Elder Haney. Uh, I, I showed up wearing a, a rainbow flag lapel pin and it, we had a, we had a good discussion, uh, that, you know, again, I, I'll talk about the details of it because I feel like transparency is important. I know there's some probably members listening to this who think, oh no, if Evan's talking about his meetings with general authorities, that's going to maybe make them not have other meetings. And I, I don't think that's the case. I think transparency, hopefully the other members who hear this will say, okay, we should be pushing these members, these leaders to have more of these discussions and to have them in open forums, right? I would love to have like a Q&A meeting public where you know, someone like Derek Knox is discussing something with, with the general authority or just even just like a, uh, where, where these questions are presented to them and they answer them in real time. Because I think there's there's a real lack of of, of transparency and what's going in, on in their minds on this issue. So, Elder Haney, um, I could tell he didn't really want me to publish the part about. But we started the meeting saying nothing in your. Well, first he started saying you're. This is a really long document. You, I was a litigator, so I'm I'm not a litigator. I'm a corporate lawyer, right? So I do transactions like mergers and help venture capital finance things and stuff. He was a litigator and he said, I think you, you don't realize that when you submit something to a judge, a judge has a page limit. He goes, I can tell you're not a litigator because there's no page limit here. I said, yeah. Okay. It was like 110 pages what I sent him. Um, and the, he said there, there's, there's that notwithstanding. And he had marked it up. He had, he had, uh, tabs, he had, he had highlighted, he'd read the whole thing. He said, there's nothing in here that is, uh, contrary to, to church doctrine. Uh, cause I wrote it in a way again, where I was walking the line, right? I said, there, this doctrine's changed, this, that doctrine's changed. You know, there's been leaders who have admitted that there's errors in sometimes in doctrine. And I have quotes to all of this in the book, like quotes from general authorities and from others about how there's errors sometimes in scripture and there's errors and, and, and how change occurs. And, um, so he said, there's nothing in here that is actually contrary, um, and nothing that you're going to get disciplined over, even though in the book. I say, if we really are going to love, then we need to see this change. It's like, you're not, and Cheryl asked that. She said, are, are, are we here to, cause Evan's going to get disciplined. And he said, no, nothing. You're not gonna do that. And I was glad that he said that. Cause my stake president was sitting there listening to him say that. Um, but he said, your tone, he said, who's your, who's your target audience? And I said, well, I, I want other parents or, or believing members, um, they're, they're my audience. They need, I hope that they will realize that they can accept that gay marriage might eventually happen in the church. I actually talked in my book about how I think when the church decided to change its position on sexual or a gay sexual orientation being no longer, it's not a choice, right? When they recognize that it's not a choice, I said, I think the train left, the, left the station and the train to doctrinal change town is, is a reference I use in my book. I said, that's going to happen because you can't have that admission with a, a doctrine that says, okay, you were born this way, but you have to live in a, in a way that's counter to what all the evidence shows is good for human health and well-being. If the church is going to have that, it's negative fruit. And we talked a lot in that interview about the negative fruit of the church's doctrine and how, you know, he said, well, it, that negative fruit, it, it, it members, the church, gay members can realize that it's not going to last forever. You know, after this life, it, it's not going to continue. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? Like, they're no longer going to be gay because there's not gay relationships in heaven, apparently, right? In the social kingdom, you can't, there's no gay ceilings. So they turn straight. And he said, well, yeah, from what we know, it's not going to be, a, you know, a, 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 an eternal condition to have same-sex attraction. I said, well, that causes a lot of gay members to want to end their lives because they say, I'm dealing with this now. And if I if I kill myself, it'll end. And 
he hadn't really, I don't think he had processed, he, he thought about that much, but um, he told me that in my book, I needed to change my tone if my target audience was believing members because there was, it was anger. My, my tone had some anger. And so that's why I hired Marcy actually, um, just to kind of get the chronology there. I'd had that meeting with the general authority first before I, I kind of talked to some other people like Derek who were helping with the book. And that's where that suggestion came from was, okay, let's, let's get somebody to help. So she helped me soften it. Um, and she actually took, I had, it, I had chapter two was the meeting with elder McCune in my book initially in the manuscript. And she said, let's put it back to chapter nine and let's have all the other arguments that you lay out about, you know, the science of gay sexual orientation, uh, the way the church has changed its doctrine on, on tons of other issues, including on, on homosexuality, how let's have all of that first and then have this experience with, and your family experience, your family story. Cause my book, it's an interesting mixture of a lot of legal, and it's not legal analysis technically, but it's, it's a now it's, it's an analytical book that I think is best used as a resource rather than a page turner. And that's why I structured the book. There's a long table of contents with a series of questions in it. So people can just like pick whatever question they find of most interest and flip to that section. Um, and she wanted me to have all of that stuff up front and then have this bad experience because it just shows where I was coming from, the mentality I had going into that meeting where Cheryl and I felt like we were able to make it work um, to serve in the church and to be as affirming to our to, to Wes as we knew we needed to be and to have that just kind of ripped from us and to have that traumatic experience. It, it was more meaningful to have it be towards the back. So anyway. It seemed like that was uh, that was a large expense for the church to fly your stake president out there <laughs> um, and have you meet at 50 North Temple, the headquarters of the church, um, just to tell you to soften your tone a little bit, um, yeah. which leads me to believe, um, because I have read the book, yeah. <laughs> that there's something in here that the church doesn't necessarily love. And, right. and I don't know if um, you've alluded that it was maybe a tone issue, but um, I tend to believe it's a uh, policy versus person issue. Yeah, that it this doesn't this doesn't do what the church wants to do all the time, and that's keep the good name of the church first and foremost. Yeah. This really exposes some of the really dark, hidden closets, secrets that are ha hanging out in the LDS church's um, LGBTQ closet. Yes. And it does, a, it does an excellent job at exploring the chronology of, of why some church leaders did what they did, why the church continues to do what they do um, in, in terms of treatment of LGBTQ people. And I would, I mean, wholly believe that as a general authority for the church, um, anything they could do to go into damage control uh, would be to their benefit. I think you're right. Um, you know, he didn't come out and say it that way. Um, but did, I, I think that they, there's a lot of things in that book that a lot of members don't, don't know about, right? A, the general church membership, I think is unaware of how much doctrine has changed over the years in the church. I, I even being on this side of the aisle was unaware of that. But once I, once I started realizing that there, there were so many things that had changed, um, I was an all in, active, believing, gay Mormon myself. Yep. Um, and it, it compelled me to write um, on, the, on record. the record, which I love. You're, you're on the record. Like if it's, I think that's the most important document that any church member can read on LGBTQ issues. And I say that having spent hours and hours and hours writing my own book, your, your, that document that you pulled together is just an amazing collection. Uh, it, 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 it lays it out in a way that, um, there's, it's so compelling because there's no personal, there's no, there's no, there's no commentary. It's just, these are the facts. This is what the, the general authorities have been teaching from day one. Right. And, and it goes all the way through, all the way through till now. And to sit there and to read quote after quote, after quote, where you see the homophobia and the fear and the harm that leaders of the church at the topmost levels have been teaching for hundreds of years now. Um, and you realize that even recently now they're, they're trying to make it better, but they're doing it in some ways it's even worse because 
gaslighting's happening, right? They're 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 trying to say, hey, well, we we didn't ever really teach this, and and, and now they're trying to 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 really get to the same end, which is gay marriage is bad, without actually being as harmful. The harmful rhetoric is not as as clear, but the end result is still the same, which is gay members of the church can't live loving in loving relationships the way that uh their you know their nature wants that you can't marry consistent with your sexual orientation and it's the same thing yeah and what i'm finding in when i started um compiling those store the the messaging in on the record what i was only able to get for the first probably 120 years of mormons mormonism's history were the public um over the pulpit on the record talks that general authorities were or prophets or um church leaders were speaking to the general audience i, I was only able to get the official correlated um some of it's been deleted now that the church has gotten rid of but i was still able to find source and and show what these church leaders were saying but in the last 20 years something different changed and if you really if you read on the record a little deeper you'll see that a lot of those stories um, and a lot of the messaging that has come out has has come out as a result of people like you who shared the behind the scenes um, discussions, the leaked audio, the leaked versions of what the church is saying, um, not to the general membership in public, but what is the church saying behind closed doors? Yeah. To me, that was even more fascinating because it, 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 it plays into exactly what you talked about earlier in this interview, where these general authorities will allude to the idea that so many of these doctrinal and policy issues that the church face today already already have a resolution the the church has already come to a point where they've decided what they want to do with this topic it's just now in the hands of the president to make yeah. it politically in a in a position where the the least amount of harm is done to the church and that harm is typically translated to uh the the least number of people who leave the church uh, the fewest number of people who will be injured or harmed or offended um, the amount of tithing money that could potentially right. be lost as a result of making these decisions. So all those factor, all those play a factor into actually how things, um, evolve, um, or are naturally laid out in, in Mormonism. And that's what to me has become so fascinating in the latter part of on the record is just how much we see behind the curtain, um, in Oz. Yeah. All of the levers and pulleys and ropes that are being pulled behind the scenes. And then what we actually see over a general conference pulpit, they're, they're polar opposites. Right. And I, and I think what that's doing to Mormonism is saying, who do we trust? Where does this message really come from? And through your experience and so many of the other experiences that I've, I've highlighted here on this podcast, at the end of the day, if you put church against family in the minds of a traditional Latter-day Saint, the family is going Families. to win Yeah, every single every time. time. And every that time. that is harming the church. And I don't think the church has a narrative for how to combat that. Um, it's one thing to say something behind the scenes. It's another to say something over the pulpit. But when each family is packing their bags and they're circling the wagons, and protecting um, their own family, their, their, the people that they love the most, there's no message in Mormonism for that. There's no way to combat that. Yeah, no, totally. And there are, I, since I've got into this space publicly, um, like I said, I've seen that harm more than I was ever aware of it before. Um, I, I'm in a, in a Facebook group called I'll Walk With You, which is for Latter-day Saint parents of LGBTQ children. And um, to see the stories that these parents, I, I help moderate the group. Uh, there's, you know, eight of us that, that take turns moderating and we get about probably 10 to 15 new members a week coming into that group. Parents who are just trying to figure out what this all means that this church that they've known and loved and had positive feelings about is the cause of so much pain for their child. How do you balance this? And there are children who are, I mean, you read the stories on in there of children who have self-harm, suicidal ideation, suicides are happening. I didn't know 
that side of everything. I, I knew that I, 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 I had some empathy and I looked at some of the you know game members and I said, I couldn't live that. Why would we want to have him? But, but seeing that harm more in a real tangible way with people that I've connected with it, since being in this space, it's just made me realize we need to stop talking behind closed doors and we need to open the doors and open the conversations. I, I love that. That's a really great analogy. About a year ago, uh, you reached out and said, you wrote this book um, as an active Latter-day Saint. I did. I, and I want people to, to understand that. I firmly believing member when I wrote this book. Um, I've since had kind of a, the rabbit hole experience of going down and, and understanding the origins of scripture, um, not just the Book of Mormon, but the Bible and other things that have led me to, to no longer believe in the church. Um, so I wrote an afterword to my book uh, where I described that I'm now kind of what I would call, I don't like labels, but if I were to label myself, I'd be a Latter-day Saint humanist uh, in the sense that I'm, I can't, I, I love my Latter-day Saint culture and history. It, like I, it's, it's part of me. Um, I learned a lot of good things. I want to take the good things and, and hold on to those and not have the bad, but I'm also a humanist in the sense now where I don't know if, I, I need evidence to, 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 to know whether God exists. Um, I'm open to the idea, but I haven't seen any evidence um, that, that he does, that, that there is a God. Um, but that doesn't mean one of the things I love about humanism is it's the focus is beyond being good without God, right? Just loving and having the kindness. We evolved as a human species to love one another because that, that helps the survival of the species. We should just lean into that. Who we are as humans um, is, is where I'm at now. Um, but I don't want that to detract. I wanted to, I, I posted the afterward and, and we've resigned our church memberships as of January in this, uh, 2022. I posted the afterward at the same time to explain that decision because I want to be authentic and, and honest and open, right? It's not in the hard copy version of the book because the after the book's already printed before I did that, but I, I, on the website, um, which Wes helped design actually, um, there is the afterward that's included there. And I, I wanted to, I, I want to be open about where I'm at, but I also don't want to detract from what I hope people will read in the book, which is you can be a believing, sincere, uh, a sincere believer in the church and recognize that this issue on this issue, the church has it wrong um, because of the harm that's being caused. And there's so many, I mean, I have a, I have an index at the back of the book. It's a topical index. Uh, because I, when I was writing, there's so many quotes from the brother and it's almost like, um, you know, on the record has all these quotes and stuff. My book has the quotes and then it has my inner stuff, not, not all the same quotes you have, but it has a lot of different, um, resources that are available for people. And if they want to just focus on the, on the quotes themselves, I have that index at the back, which on the online version, it's also a browsable version. It's not just a PDF. You can go onto the website and click to the resources and find them. Um, I think that the the ability to just pull up and I, I tried to only cite websites that I knew were church friendly. When I was writing the book, I intentionally was like, okay, I want, I'm a believing member. I want to show other members that we have stuff in our doctrine and in our, from leaders, quotes from leaders that, and scriptures. One of the, the, the subtitle for the book is um, my journey, your journey and a scriptural path forward. So I, I wanted to say, look, there's, there's scriptures. There's, there's so many ways that we can get there with just what we have right now. And I didn't want to put anyone off and thinking that I was writing an anti-Mormon book. And it's not, even though I've lost my belief now, I really don't want anyone who reads it to, to judge it from that lens because it wasn't written that way. The last chapter of the book, ironically, is why I'm going to stay in the church. Um, and I'm going to focus on love and charity and, and helping other people. And I, the whole book talks about why I'm staying in, in different, different ways. Um, so I, I know that now I'm not staying and I hope people would afford me the grace of being on a journey where I don't know what the future is going to be. Um, but I, I don't want, I, I want it to continue to be a resource that believing members can use, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it makes, it makes a lot of sense. And I, I also think it is a, uh, his, it is a, a scriptorial uh, evidence of Mormonism, um, namely the ninth article of faith. Yeah. That your book alone is evidence that 
you are waiting for further light and knowledge. Yes. This is a line upon line, precept upon precept experience. And I find that um, being a, a very real experience, a very real concept for those who are impacted by this topic, that it, it's we have to put our foot on that path at some point. And, and where our foot lands um, is wholly based upon a lot of our own personal experiences, where and how we land on that path. But it's what we do when we set our foot on the path that makes all the difference. Do we stay on it? And, right. and do we continue to move forward uh, in that, that journey, that navigation in this space, or do we shy away from it? And too often, I think Latter-day Saints want to not talk about this topic. They yeah. want to... Uh, still consider this so taboo that we don't discuss it so you don't become it, that we don't um, impact further Latter-day Saint families by discussing topics of sexual orientation or gender identity. But in the wake of all this are, as we've explained in this episode, real lived experiences, real families, yeah. real pain, um, real trouble for the church, um, death by suicide, yeah. um, for a church that believes so wholly in supporting and raising a strong family, they do such an excellent job at ripping apart queer families. They do. And that's one of the things that new members to our parents group um, express gratitude for is to have a space where they can actually talk about these issues. There's over 3000 members of that group now, and they love being able to join it and make a post about the pain they're feeling and, and sometimes the anger that they're feeling and to have it be received with love and understanding and compassion. You can't have that same experience at church when you attend church. And I, 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 I wish you could, I wish, you know, the idea that the church is a, isn't a, a place for perfect people. It's a, it's a hospital for, for sick people or for sinners. They, you know, that's what they, the analogy is. I wish that that was actually true that you could go there and you could talk about your pain more than you are. But for some reason, members of the church at church are very uncomfortable with anything that makes them feel not the positive, happy vibes, right? If you have any, anything that's tough and hard, you almost, there's almost like an unwritten rule at church that you don't talk about those things. Like if someone's up in a testimony meeting and they're wearing their testimony and they talk about a really heavy topic, um, you can see a lot of people squirming sometimes like the, the idea in testimony meeting is you're just supposed to bear your testimony about this. You know, the church is true. The church is true. The church is true. That's what you want to hear in church. It's just that affirmation of that same message every single week in different ways and different topics, but it's still the same thing. You're just building up the dogma and you're building up why the church is so great. And I think we need to shift that and start focusing at church on supporting each other in our, hardships and focusing on not the dogma, but the person like let's put people over policy, like you say, and that should reflect in our Sunday experience. And it, it doesn't, I think policy is very much more a focus at on day to day in the church. I think it's, it, that's, it's an excellent um, analysis of what that's the real lived experience of a, a lot of Latter-day Saints. Just as we wrap the podcast, we've covered a lot of territory. Um, the last part of your book, you offer uh, resources, and you alluded to um, I'll Walk With You as one of those resources. Um, and you've also included Latter-day Stories as yep. uh, one of the resources that um, parents, people who are navigating this journey for the first time uh, through the middle part of the journey um, and all points in between um, can rely on. What other resources are available out there to Latter-day Saints who are um, trying to better understand the lived experiences of the LGBTQ community, who have children who have come out, who are facing this nuance in their own personal uh, path, uh, holding onto the rod? Yeah, I would say um, the, the one that hit me the most and, and, and really was helpful uh, was um, mormonlgbtqquestions.com, which was an essay that was written by Bryce Cook. Um, and it, 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 uh, it, my, a lot of my arguments in my book, um, and I say this in the book, right? I say, I, I base a lot of my arguments on what I've, I've learned from that essay and reading that essay about how the doctrine can change and what it was and how it can get there. Uh, another one, um, that I, I highlight in my book is, um, Taylor Petrie's article, uh, toward a post heterosexual theology 
um, that he wrote, I don't know when that was, probably 2011 maybe? It was a long time ago. Um, that one really changed my mindset, which was, wow, we could actually, like gay ceilings, you know, same-sex ceilings in the temple are not necessarily inconsistent with the ceiling doctrine if you if you look at it historically and what actually the origins of the of the idea of ceiling which is to unite all of all of humanity yeah. right right and and you know you have two men uh creating the world right you know jehovah and and michael from what we know in the temple um and and other places i'm not talking about bad things in the temple. i'm not you know divulging any temple um, sacred things because when they talk about that as a doctrine it's you have men who are create who who have a relationship they're creating um, we don't know how spiritual procreation actually happens we don't know so much but that article just opened my mind and that's a lot of where chapter six goes on in my book talks about how gay ceiling could potentially fit into to mormon theology um, the other resources that i think are really good um, carolyn pearson has a couple books that are phenomenal um, uh, one is the, uh, circling the wagons. I, th I forget the actual name of the book and I wish I, I, I should look. It's on my website. There's and a goodbye. I love you. Goodbye. I love you was a fir her first one. Yeah. It, it tells the story of her supporting her, uh, gay husband, um, as he was dying and amazing. Um, and there, you know, lift, listen, learn and love is a really good resource. And I would say, actually, I need to, I need to give huge, uh, props to Richard Osler. When Cheryl made her Facebook post, he reached out to us and actually flew out to Boston and met with us. Um, and that meant a lot to Cheryl and me that we had, you know, former Bishop who now was in this space of trying to help people understand LGBTQ realities better, was ministering to us in a way that was incredibly meaningful and it was going out of his way. We, you know, Elder McEwen during our interview told us that he felt like maybe he was there to minister to our family more than to reorganize the state presidency. And I, I exchanged one email with him and right after that meeting, then like the, the following week and I haven't heard, didn't ever hear from him, but Richard has been a friend and been with us and done a ton to, to help us feel supported and loved. And he had us on his podcast. We did uh, it's episode 291 of listen, learn and love. Cheryl and I did that podcast uh, in July of 2020 when I released my book. Um, and I initially released my book as a website because I wanted it to be free and just be out there, um, you know, in browsable format or PDF format. And then I got dozens and dozens of people saying, look, we're having a hard time printing out your PDF. Like we can do it, but it's hundreds of pages. Like, do you have a book version? And so then I kind of, I kind of got into this, I Amazon self-publishing and, and that's why it's the hard copy. I, I never intended it to be a book. I donate all proceeds from the, the sale of the book to LGBTQ charities. Um, but yeah, it, I do have a favorite resources page on the website and in the back of the book that, that highlights all those. And listen, learn, and love is an indispensable one. I think it, especially for parents who are, for anyone really in, in the space, who's first trying to find a, a soft landing and find a church friendly, but also LGBTQ affirming uh, as, much as, as much as you can in, in, in the doctrine. Uh, air place to, to land. It's it's an amazing resource. And Richard's done a phenomenal job. Yeah, I, I agree with that. It is a, I think we're all looking for areas of soft landing in this yep. space. And, um, and we talked about this off camera earlier, just the natural attrition rate in this space um, is warranted where we are looking for resources to help people fall out of the closet in a very healthy way. Yep. And once they fall out of the closet, we want to get them to the point where they can run and either r run in a more healthy way towards church or run in a more healthy way away from church. Um, and, and that doesn't necessarily mean you're running away from spirituality. You're running away from happiness. You're, it's that you are in a much better position to be able to uh, address and understand not only who and what you are, but how to thrive and not just survive, which yeah. is the space that so many queer people find themselves in just living until tomorrow. I, I want to get people to a spot where they can thrive in their existence and that they can live the fullest measure of their creation, that they can be seen for the beautiful people that they are um, and and for the beautiful beautiful people that they love. Yeah. That is why I think resources like this are super uh, important and, and beneficial to the overall um, message 
that, that you've shared in your book um, and, and also share in your personal life. What haven't we covered that you wanted to cover in this episode? Um, oh. and we, we took the audience a little longer than the typical hour. So um, thankfully, we've, we've primed that pump a little bit for them. And, um, but is, is there something that, that you wanted to, uh, wanted to share that we didn't hit through the course of this, this discussion? Well, I, what comes to my mind on the resources front, I actually want to mention Blair Osler's book, uh, Queer Mormon Theology. That is, I think she uh, does a better job than than my book. My book's very kind of analytical. She does a really good job from a philosophical perspective of analyzing the theology and arguing for, for how, how things could change. Another great resource um, to be on the block podcast, like I mentioned, all those things. Um, but go, look, look at that favorite resources page and, and, and explore that. And I guess from a personal level, the only other thing I would say is love to me is it's the golden rule and it's the bare minimum of any religion or any belief system that's it's the bare minimum that you should have is the golden rule. And I feel very strongly that the, the church's position on LGBTQ issues just isn't reflective of even the golden rule. The golden rule is do unto others as you want them to do if you were in their shoes and look at, put yourself in those shoes of LGBTQ members of the church. Would you want to, have the doctrines and the policies facing you that face them. And I think that's the biggest, the biggest way that this will eventually change is when more members put themselves in those shoes. I mean, Ben Shalati's book actually is a soft landing too, right? Uh, a walk in my shoes. That's a good one to read too. Uh, uh, it's very soft landing, but I would, I would say empathy and the golden rule is the focus that people should have. Once again, um, where can the audience find um, your book? How, how do they get a copy of the um, free version, but also if they want to save some HP ink and not print it out? <laughs> and I will say, like, um, when Bryce published his essay, yeah. uh, it, it was 62 pages long. And I also just, I ate it up. I thought for yeah. sure someone at 50 North Temple was going to kill his server so no yeah. one could read it. And, and so I printed it out as well. And then eventually on this podcast, um, I did interview Bryce about that essay, which yeah. was just a, just a fantastic, fantastic interview. I love interview. That one. Yeah. yeah. But how can people find your book? So it's gay LDS crossroads.org. And if you go there, you can browse it on uh, you know internet browser, or you can download a PDF, or you can also click on a link that'll take you to Amazon where you can purchase a Kindle or a paperback version. Um, and th the last thing I would say, actually, Kyle, if I can do this is to, I would hope that all members of the church would do what, what Bryce did, right? Which is find a way to speak out about it. I know that leadership roulette is a real thing. Some bishops are more permissive and some stake presidents are more permissive than others, but find out whatever that threshold is where you are locally. I mean, if you're comfortable going past the threshold, great, do it, please. But even if you're not, if you, if you don't want to get into trouble with the church, if you want to try to be an ally to LGBTQ people, push the boundaries. Find out what you can do to show more love and be public about it in ways that Bryce was. I mean, Bryce was a huge inspiration for why I wanted to do the book. I actually called him. He read a draft. I called him. We had a good call, a good conversation when I was, I was working on the manuscript. Uh, he's just a great example of somebody who saw a problem and decided to do something about it. And I, I hope all members of the church do that, whether it's locally or publicly or however they do it. Try to, try to help. Perfect. Evan, thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, thank you for sharing. Um, some deep and personal parts of your story um, and for your family's journey to better um, pave the way for other LDS families, uh, other religious families. This podcast is uh, listened to by people other than just people with a Mormonism uh, background in Mormonism. But thank you for paving a way for um, other families to see a better future forward. Um, maybe in light of... Uh, Boyd K. Packer's Candle of the Lord talk. Oh. We all had to take a few steps into the darkness to find that the way was lighted ahead. Yeah. And thank you for providing uh, some of that light for those who are still taking a few steps into the darkness. Thank you, Kyle. Because there, there is uh, some light ahead. And um, send our love back to your wife as well. Oh, well, I will for sure. And thank her also for um, being that special witness of Christ um, and, and for being 
a lot of that glue that held that Smith family together. Yeah, we're never we we've, we've never been happier, and she she really is the the backbone and inspiration for for all of us. Never before have I been more uh, happy to see that a special witness of Christ via a general authority's uh, proclamations did not come true <laughs> than, than the one where uh, your family is still whole and happy and thriving. Yeah, definitely thriving, better than we've ever been. Great. Again, thank you. Thank you. Another fantastic episode uh, here on Latter Gay Stories. What did you think? Um, do you have a comment? Um, a question for Evan. If you are watching on our video version, we invite you to share that below and we'll have a real time discussion. If you are listening on the audio version of the podcast, we, I invite you to reach out to Evan as well um, through his uh, book, um, through social media. He's, I see him on Mormons Building Bridges. He's in a lot of the Facebook groups, especially with uh, I'll Walk With You if you are a uh, active Latter-day Saint family who is uh, trying to better understand this uh, this. Uh, this area, this topic of discussion, um, having a queer child, I absolutely and highly recommend I'll Walk With You as a resource uh, for you and your family. But again, we want to thank Evan for sharing his story uh, and and the experience that he's had navigating this world with his son and, and his family and uh, through his service in the church. If you uh, help us, if something in this episode... Um, caused a little stir, some burning of the bosom. We invite you to share this episode and make a comment as well. Those help us to build bigger and stronger bridges between the LDS and LGBTQ communities. It also helps us to expand the reach of this podcast by just liking and, and subscribing wherever you watched or listened uh, to this episode. This episode and others are available online through our website at LatterGayStories.org, also available everywhere you catch your favorite audio podcasts. Uh, we're here to help and share a greater level of visibility uh, through the LDS and LGBTQ community. It's stories like yours, like mine, and Evan's that help us each continue writing our own Latter-Gay story. <laughs>